Okay, welcome to the Danger Zone podcast. We are going on the road <laughs> to Oklahoma City to the airport. I have Martha Tanzi with me, and we're going to try and do this interview on the road. This is a Danger Zone podcast first. <laughs> so, welcome, and uh, let's get started. And of course, we have traffic. Uh, as we're getting ready to get on the interstate. So, first question is, how did you end up at, or let me back up, let me let me kind of dial people in right now. So, we're leaving the Ultra 4 event in Davis, Oklahoma, uh, the Holly EFI Ultra 4 racing at the Crossbar Ranch. And <laughs> this is getting interesting already. So, anyways, first question, Martha. How in the hell did you get to the Holly AFI Ultra 4? And what brought you to Davis, Oklahoma? So, I've been on the road for quite a while. Um, and kind of going races to race, event events. Um, doing different things, helping people all over. Um, I kind of just, you know, people contact me and they have a dream and so I try to help fulfill that dream. And um, I was in Moab um, kind of unexpectedly um, out practicing um, rock crawling and um, there was a rally on the rocks going on which is like a UTV event, kind of like a UTV event for um, equivalent would be like a Easter Jeep Safari for Jeeps. So a great big rally. So I was having fun there, practicing in a um, Jeep that I'll be competing in again. Uh, let's see, I'll compete next weekend at the Old School Rock Crawling. Um, owner of the car is Clay Egan, an uh, awesome guy. And so I want to um, practice it in his vehicle before I go out and compete and um, kind of get familiar with it. So that's what I was in the middle of. And then I ended up meeting this uh, gentleman um, named Dave Upton. and. Um, he sponsors an Ultra 4 car and so we get to talking and um, he was saying that the gentleman he sponsors didn't have a co-driver and he found out I do co-driving and so um, he asked if you know I'd be interested in doing that for him in Oklahoma uh, like this weekend um, which would be just a couple days out from when we were talking because I think we were talking Tuesday Wednesday time frame and um, so we contacted um, Jeff Caudill and um, he was interested in having me and uh, so I took Clay's truck and trailer and rig and got it back to Salt Lake City where Clay lives and dropped it off and I got my rental and went to the airport um, that same night so I pretty much drew, drove through the night flew through the early morning and uh, got to Dallas where I got picked up by the tribe guys, uh, Matt Howell and Adam Shear, and uh, Rhonda, uh, Matt's wife was super sweet, got me from the airport, and then I rode up from Dallas to um, the track and uh, helped set up, um, and that was Thursday. And then um, there was a gentleman um, that needed uh, a co-driver to go out and do some pre-running because he didn't have his co-driver there yet. Um, so I went out, did some co-driving, um, got to see the course, and it was dry at that point. Um, it wasn't anything crazy. Uh, there was two hills. One had some mud on it. The other one was just a rock face. Um, a lot of open sections. Just like three or four hazards that we were concerned about. Um, nothing major. So, next day, um, we get a major, major storm. Oh my goodness. And I'm not familiar with this area since I'm from Alaska. Um, this whole tornado thing and crazy storms, it was kind of new to me. I didn't know, you know, wasn't sure what to expect. Um, we got high winds, it was destroying stuff. We got flooding. Um, it was insane. So. 
there's only one way in that I know of to the track um, and it was getting flooded super super bad to where people couldn't come and go um, and that was Friday night uh, we had a cancel qualifying which was supposed to happen Friday evening um, just because it was just people couldn't get in and out um, and then the course was flooded it was just a disaster so uh, Friday my team that was supposed to help um, Jeff Cottell he shows up um, and we got to do some pre-running before the major storm came um, but it was money it was a lot muddier than the day before um, which which made it have so many more challenges and uh, but we had a blast we connected really well um, we then we had this the storm and then next morning um, all of our races got pushed back a little bit um, just because of the weather it was so bad um, so then uh, race day we got ready to go we were in the 4400 class so we were the last ones to run so they run the UTVs then they ran the limited class and they ran the 44 which is the unlimited class the bad boys and uh, we went out there and um, the, the course was way different than what we pre ran it as just because of all the storms um, water crossings you know or what was just a little ditch a dry, dry ditch or a little bit of mud it was now really deep water it was crazy um, you have a yeah I have a question so <laughs> uh, so we, we during this setup we're, we're gonna have one mic so it's not gonna be uh, it's going to be a little more segmented conversation, so I'm just going to raise my hand every time I, I have a, I have a question, and so I can I can interrupt you. But you mentioned a couple of things. Uh, one being that you're from Alaska, and I wanted to get into that, but uh, we can get into that later. And you mentioned basically you're in you're in Utah and all stuff, and traveling out here, and you're bouncing around all over the place. Uh, how? On average, how long do you spend away from home on the road? Um, I spend more time away than I do at home. I think I've been at home seven days this year. Um, and I think last year it was like three weeks total here and there I was at home. So um, even when I'm in Alaska, I'm usually not home. I'm, I'm out in the field either hunting or guiding um, or scouting or doing off-road recoveries. Um, fishing, um, wheeling, like getting to have fun, <laughs> just relax wheeling. Um, so yeah, I'm usually in the field doing doing something like that when I am in Alaska. So I'm not home very much. I'm not really a homebody. I, I kind of joke that I'm a stay-at-home mom that's not at home very much. <laughs> yeah. So that's that's pretty cool. Um, how? I guess back to the race um, from from my perspective I'll kind of set this up I, I was supposed to race in the uh, stock class for this race but we weren't able to fin finish the build in time so I got in contact with uh, Trot who works for Ultra 4 a uh, former Navy SEAL and through Warfighter Maid um, through Rob Blanton he hooked us up and I came down to uh, just kind of introduce myself to the Ultra 4 scene and then kind of see what it was all about. And that's when I uh, trot introduced me to Martha. We ran into her. And uh, so we've been uh, able to talk and uh, kind of get to know each other. And the you were involved with the, f uh, the Flyer for 22 race down in uh, Nora, right? Yeah, that was an amazing race. Um, I had first gotten with um, Racing for Vets and Navy Off-Road last year and we ran Flyer 1 in Nora and were very successful and then um, so we teamed up again this year and we were going to bring on another vehicle and joining up with Warfighter Made. Um, we, we did go down with two vehicles, um, one of which um, finished on its own power um, and then we had another one. Um, that had some transmission issues 
and uh, we were able to continue to go have it stay with us um, but we were pushing it or dragging it across the line um, each day and uh, it was a good experience for all and uh, you know sometimes that just happens with motorsports you know we just got to do what we can with what we have and you know sometimes we got a good machine that's running right and sometimes we got problem solved so <laughs> um, but all in all it was a really good race a really good group of guys I, I look forward to racing with them every chance I get um, yeah that was pretty inspirational to see um, just the team coming together at least from what I saw on video and you know you guys really I think showing everybody kind of a lesson um of you know perseverance and just like pushing through no matter what and uh not giving up i think i think it was a pretty cool message that you sent across the off-road community and just like you know any average joe can can definitely learn from you guys's trip down there uh let's go uh i don't want to i want us to like finish up kind of what happened this weekend and we can start diving into some of the other questions I had for you so let's uh let me ne stop rambling and we'll get just kind of uh finish out your your race this weekend and how it went and uh <laughs> talk about how you switched uh switch drivers at one point and uh, the, uh everything that went down with that so uh it's pretty cool myself I was um down at dead man slide initially and then we started getting a lot of uh race cars stuck down in uh trout line and so we had to go down there and redirect a lot of people to uh keep the race going um so it got a little hectic but i saw you out there on the course so let's hear it from uh the co-driver co perspective it was so fun being able to see you guys that I recognize when I come up on these crazy optical obstacles, you know, like I'd see uh, Brian Trotter, I'd see you or JT, and it was nice seeing you guys out there helping direct, and because um, when you're in the car, you, you have no idea what's in front of you, and you don't know which way to go, and you don't know the disaster and everything, so um, I greatly appreciate your time and everybody else's time for coming out and um, helping make sure this was a safe course. As far as I know, nobody got hurt. Um, we had some potentials, obviously, with motorsports, there's potentials to get hurt. Um, and, you know, I rolled over in a car and such, but uh, everything was in place for getting us back over. Safety was there. Um, people were there. Equipment was there. People were working hard. So I appreciate all the, the volunteers and the staff and the owners and the owners of the course and everybody for stepping up and, and doing a good job there. Um, so, yeah, like I was saying, I was starting out with um, a team from Indiana, uh, Car 513. Um, we went out and we did pre pretty good on first uh, first lap. First lap has two loops, so every lap has two loops. You have a loop A and a loop B. Um, on loop B of lap one, um, we ended up going into a, a mud hole that was deeper than we expected, and we took water in um, through the air filter and into the engine. Um, we got it to start running again because uh, it died on us. Um, got it to start running again, but it wasn't quite right. Oil pressure is down to seven. Um, it wasn't looking good, uh, but we were able to. R motor was running. We kept going. Um, got back, you know, into pits. Checked everything out. Um, the owner and driver made it the call to keep going, and uh, so we did. And so on lap two. Um, loop A. Um, we were driving along and all of a sudden uh, motor locked up and uh, we had, there was no more there's no more going <laughs> no more forward momentum um, so we, we coasted off to the side um, there was another vehicle that uh, had been swamped out in the mud and so we went and helped that vehicle um, get themselves taken care of, fixed up, get them back in the car, and, and get them on their way. Um, it takes a lot of time just to get yourself resituated, all your tools back away and into the car. And so um, we were able to help get them buckled back in, get them safe. Um, 
And then uh, shortly after that, a vehicle pulls up, pulls over the side, and we, you know, he was hurting. He had uh, mud completely caked over his face. I mean, everything inside the cab was just a disaster with mud. Um, he's got two holes where your feet go. There's nothing, there's no uh, separator between your body and the outside world. It's just all open. So any mud or anything, um, water, whatever he went through, the tires just kind of shoveled it right into the cab. <laughs> so he was, he was just right. Um, but he didn't have a co-driver, and so uh, me and uh, our drive, you know, the driver went over. Uh, me and Jeff did, and said, "Hey, are you doing okay? Do you need anything? Um, do you need a co-driver?" And he said he needs rags and a co-driver. So um, I hopped in with him. I honestly didn't even know his name, <laughs> um, and uh, but you know, I was sitting there, and we weren't able to to do anything in our end. Um, so at least I could go help out. With a uh, race like this, you have to be a banded driver or co-driver in order to be in a vehicle and help. Um, even wrenching on the vehicle, um, any outside assistance, if you're not a banded driver or co-driver, you get disqualified. Um, so he couldn't like go into his pits and just and grab somebody else. Um, he had to have somebody who was already abandoned for the race. Um, so I guess he originally, later on I find out, um, he originally had a co-driver, but after the first lap, um, experienced how brutal of a race it was with so much mud coming in on you um, and the challenges of being able to see, challenge of navigating. Just it's, It was a very, very challenging race because of all the mud and all the water. His first co-driver gave up after the first lap. Um, and so he was at without a co-driver so that's how he ended up in that situation um i hop in for whatever reason when he i guess went through some water or something he lost calm so we had no communication like we normally do in a race car um you plug in with your helmets and you can talk back and forth and you can talk with your pit um, with his system being down it was all hand signals so um his gps was working for the most part there was some in and out issues i think there was mud on like the system so it wasn't able to get satellite properly is my guess we were having some issues with that um in the first car um so i did the best i could um hand signals yelling um and uh and then my other function was um like i was telling you the floor was completely open to the outside, so I kind of was blocking water and mud with my feet, and the air filter was like under my knees. So I was kind of using my body to shield the air filter from getting water and mud on it, um, and then my feet to try to keep, you know, less mud and water getting inside. And so, um, did that. We had a little bit of overheating issues. Obviously, we had mud all over the radiators. Um, electric fans don't like having mud in them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we had some issues there and then uh, the belt um, had mud and water on it and so it wasn't working efficiently um, it was slipping on the water pump it was slipping on the alternator so we kept having intermittent issues there um, but uh, we were hard charging we kept going um, we came to a, a mud hole uh, it was really 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 rutted out um, the main normal trail had vehicles that were stuck in, uh, on it so we had to take bypasses, and the bypass was, was nasty. Um, we ended up uh, rolling over in that mud hole um, because we were gotten some ruts and just slipped off and fell over. So um, that was fun. <laughs> Got out and um, was able to winch us back over. We worked together as a team really well in that situation. Um, then uh, kept going and uh, we ended up having a couple other issues where things are just rotted out so bad we couldn't make it through um, and we uh, had Josh England which is awesome and uh, he just popped out of the woods right when we need him and he uh, helped us winch uh, out of that mud hole um, and uh, so yeah then we kept going and um, we were stopped by JT, uh, they were trying to close the course down, and we we're like, "No, let us let us finish." So, um, we let us finish, and I think we we're one of the last people that come across the finish line. But but finishing a race like that is amazing. I mean, 
just finishing is an accomplishment. So, um, yeah, that was a fun day. I think I had been in mud for like 10 hours, it felt like. Um, I was very wet and cold. <laughs> but I love mud um, coming from Alaska. I mean, I, I didn't know there was wheeling that didn't have mud into it until uh, just a couple of years ago when I started experiencing wheeling down here in the States. So I love it. I, I'm experienced in it. I know how to deal with it. I'm not scared of it. So races like this, I, I enjoy. Awesome. It's really cool to hear you describe, like, going through the course and just kind of some of the experiences you run into. One question I had for you real quick is uh, just – that popped in my head is do you in mud and water situations would there be ever be a time that you turn off the electric fans to like keep them from uh like i guess when you know stuff is getting flung in there to keep them from flinging it uh, mud and water everywhere in the engine compartment um so wheeling is different than racing in that aspect um in my opinion so like wheeling um, yeah, you'd want to, you know, nice and slow and steady. You get to like a river crossing um, or, you know, mud, deep, deep mud. Yeah, you'd want to turn them off, go through it and turn them back on. Um, and you'd pull over if it's mud, rinse it out really good. Because you don't want a bunch of mud in there with those little plastic fans. Um, because you got all that resistance, you know, you want to clean that, make sure it's nice and clean. You're not trying to fight anything. Um, with racing, you don't really have that luxury. Like I was saying, it takes a lot of time to get in and out. <laughs> and you're so muddy that, like, once you get in there and you're set, you don't want to get back out <laughs> if you don't have to. Um, so some guys have their fans on switches and can. Um, some guys are running it to be electronically controlled. They'll come on and off when they need to. Um, I think location is really important and being able to have it in a place where it's not getting a bunch of mud packed on it. Um, but yeah, if you have a great big clump of mud that comes down and it's that really thick, 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 like hard stuff, you know, it's going to mess with your fan. Um, we ended up putting a screen on a pre-runner that we ran at NorCal last weekend um, just to kind of collect all that mud before it gets to the radiator. Um, some guys will run, if they're having a, an engine-driven fan, um, they'll have a, a clutch fan where... Um, it will disengage and you know not if you have a solid mounted one you know it would be going all the time and if you hit water you can actually um, the fan blades can actually go and damage the radiator like um, we did a trek up in Alaska and uh, we had two vehicles that had actually gone in the water and the fans um, kept rotating and it hit the radiator um, and and cut the radiator and we ended up having a JB weld both of those radiators um, <clears throat> to be able to keep going because you know we're out kind of in the middle of nowhere and you got to fix it to get out kind of thing um, so yeah being able to turn them off is nice the other thing is it sprays water like if you have a, a engine driven um, style fan or electric fan they're just going to spray water all under your hood so Excuse me, being able to be able to turn that off is nice. Uh, thanks for answering that. Uh, I'm totally getting some uh, free tips right now. <laughs> uh, one of the, uh, that leads me into one of the questions that I was going to ask you is, uh, can you describe the feelings you have when you're behind the wheel uh, during a race? Like, or um, or just some of the other things you're involved in, like what it feels like for hunting, or you know what's going through your mind when you're doing those things, and uh, yeah. So if you want to dive into that, all right. I'll make sure we're on, make sure we're on course still. All right. Um, so I have a couple major things in my life right now. I've got um, my daughter, who is eight and who is usually always with me. Um, every once in a while, she is, you know, got other things going on right now. She's in Indiana with family visiting them. They just had a new baby 
Um, uh, so she's got a new cousin, and um, so she's there visiting. I try to have her with me as much as possible. Um, so I've got my daughter, um, and I've got racing, um, and I've got uh, hunting. Um, so those are like the main things going on in my life, and um, and I've got uh, traveling all the time. So when it comes to racing. Um, being behind the wheel and being a co-driver are two totally different things for me and a mindset that's totally different like I spent most of my life as a driver and I've, I've been trying to learn how to receive input and export that um, and very very quickly and so I've been on the receiving end um, and having to pay attention that way and I've gotten pretty good at that over the years. And so, um, but now I'm switching over because a lot of people need co-drivers. And so I've been trying to fulfill that need in a race team. And it's a, it's a different type of thing. I'm trying to receive input um, from the GPS, from train, from the car, from you know pit, wherever I'm getting that information from. And then I'm trying to export it to the driver. So I'm trying to give them information, give them input, um, so that way they can um, export that into the driving um, so it's been fun switching and doing that um, and, and getting to see that side of it so I want I like trying every single position of something that I'm trying to do um, so that way I can kind of see and I think I feel like I, I'm more well-rounded and I'm able to do a better job so when it um, comes to driving I love driving so much um, but I wanted to see what it felt like to be crew. I wanted to see what it felt like to be a co-driver. Um, I even enjoyed um, going and finding out what it feels like to be on staff, you know, and finding, you know, what it's like to build a course or how to run a flag or um, all that side that has to do with the event. I, I, I'm glad I went and I learned that side of it. Um, I feel like it makes me a better driver and be able to read a course because I've made a course before. So um, yeah, just well-roundedness. Um, I'm glad I have the experience to do all that. Um, so for driving, um, since I've been doing it, since I've been about over 20 years I've been driving in motorsports, whether you know, I started dirt bikes and four-wheelers, snow machines, um, then I, you know, I've done circle track asphalt and circle track dirt and ice racing and um, I even went and did go-karts recently, <laughs> and that was fun. Um, so, you know, arena tracks and um, big moose buggy off-road stuff in Alaska, um, then all the crazy stuff I've been doing down here in the States uh, with all the different series, uh, you know, Alja 4 and Score and Nor and um, Dirt Riot and stuff I did, you know, with Alja 4 and Europe and... So getting this wide variety is really fun too. Um, I think it helps being able to, to bounce around when I have a good skill set from that's really wide and variety. Um, but yeah, for me, you know, getting to drive is something that's uh, real natural for me. Um, I have nothing to prove. I just go out and have a good time and try to stay focused and be safe. That's the biggest thing for me now that I'm a little bit older is uh, being safe is very, very, very important. I want to make sure that I'm coming home. Um, and, uh, you know, we get in situations where we have to make a call as a team, you know, is it worth our life? Is this, you know, risk worth our life? So risk assessments, like in the military, we do risk assessments a lot. Um, and that's helped me do very, 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 very fast um, risk assessment to be able to figure out if something's worth it or not and make that call um so at the same time though when i get in a car i gotta be willing i gotta be willing to uh to take some risk um and be willing to die that day you know if if i wanted to play it safe i just sit on the couch um so i'm out there and um, i know in the back of my mind that that's a possibility um so uh but i don't want to let that ruin or, or let me lose focus of what i have in front of me that fear so I try to keep that in the back of my mind, but not something that's affecting me um, in a negative sense, being able to not focus. Um, 
But yeah, I enjoy the team aspect. Um, that's probably the, most, the thing I love the most about racing. Um, I, I don't think I'd want to do it just by myself. You know, like I, I really enjoy being in the car, um, whether it's just with buddies having a good time um, or if it's in a race car. Like I, I'm, I'm enjoying both of them. My mindset's similar. Um, I'm not an overly competitive person. Um, I just go out there and run my own thing, do my own thing. Um, I care about the people that are on the course. Um, they're my friends. You know, they're the people I see at every race and I want to continue to see at every race. Um, so, uh, got another question? That's, that's interesting that you say that like you're not competitive, but yet you're still, you're without being, having a competitive, um, mindset, you're still able to compete. Like that's, that's pretty cool. Um, thing because I'm super competitive it's like it's in my nature to be very like I want to win but I also do feel relaxed about it and um, and I'm gonna have fun being competitive I guess in uh, in a relaxed way and I also one of the reasons I'm entering the class I, I don't want to be an individual racer I like the idea of working as a team like conquering obstacles together and stuff like that like having somebody else there to, you know, share the suck with you, you know, and, uh, or, you know, the suckier parts, I, I find them to be like fun, you know, like the, the work side of things, I, I like manual labor and I like work. So the, the, the hard parts tend to be fun to me. And, but I'll, I know you wanted to respond to that. So here you go. I know some people would have thought I was crazy to get back in a car, <laughs> like, because it was, it was pretty, br it was pretty brutal, you know, um, but like you're saying, I just love challenges, and I get to meet and connect with people on a different level um, than just a casual meeting somebody. When you're in the trenches with them, and you're going to get some serious challenges ahead of you, and you have to work together, um, you really get to know somebody. Um, and same, hunt, racing's that way and hunting's that way because I'll take people hunting that I know very little about and after a week of 24 hours a day, 7 days a week um, you know, and put in some pretty sketchy situations life-threatening situations you really get to know them um, same with the military um, you, you, know, you get thrown together with people you don't know different backgrounds and you just got to make things happen um, yeah, I really enjoy that part of it too Okay. Um, okay. So to answer your other question um, about the competitiveness, um, when I do do well at something, it's just because I put my heart into it and I did really, I did well. I just happened to be better than the next guy. But I have no, I have no focus on anybody else other than what I'm trying to accomplish. Um, and I just do my job and I try to do my best. And I try to care about the people around me, and I, I, I do. I legitimately care about people. Um, so that's what I focus on. I try to honor God in everything that I do um, and have that as my big picture. Um, and loving people is, is kind of the base of what I'm trying to do um, with everything I'm, I'm anywhere I go so that's where I get with the non-competitiveness or, or I say I'm not overly competitive to the point where I'm wanting um, to be better than somebody else I don't have that in me I just have go out do my best and try to help make dreams come true um, with whatever the team stream is um, I try to figure what it is and help them accomplish that um, and uh, whether it's, you know, wanting to go and, and get uh, a moose or learn how to hunt or learn how to race in Mes Mexico or, you know, I want to win King of the Hammers, whatever the, the dream is, uh, then I, I try to help accomplish that um, with them. Um, so you had asked me also um, about military. And um, so I joined the military and I was the mechanic. Um, and then I became um, NCO and I was leader of a um, recovery section and it was like the best job ever because I, I got to go wheeling and I got to go work on trucks 
um, and I, I enjoyed it a lot. I, I enjoy the military aspect. Um, I love the toughness and I love the people and the structure. I, I really, really loved it a lot. Um, I ended up getting pregnant and kind of switched gears. Um, and uh, so I'm not in anymore. Um, but uh, yeah, I enjoyed my time. And uh, that's one of the things I love about um, racing uh, with Warfighter Made and racing for vets is because um, we're coming all from similar backgrounds, even though we didn't know each other. We come from similar backgrounds, we can be thrown in together and we already have the same structure. So, um, you know, being able to, to accomplish crazy missions um, it's easier when you all are playing on, you know, from the same rule book in a sense. So. Yeah, I totally agree. That's, um, I'm so fortunate to be, um, to have met Rob and get connected with Warfighter Made and like the people that surround it, like yourself and now, you know, so now I know you and um, and Trotter and all, all these other people that have met because I went to like Camp Razor out in Glamis and it's it is really cool to see that uh, how we come together and how we interact as, as opposed to like other teams you see in the other you know in the off-road community and but there's also a lot of um, even pe veterans that are in the off-road community that aren't connected to Warfighter Made, you know, and stuff. And so there's always those connections that are very easy to make. And then there's a lot of uh, just patriotic people within the off-road community. So I, I think it's when you're – and they come from, like, disciplined kind of hardworking families a lot of times where that's instilled in them. So they kind of have that – similar wavelength it's not like exactly the same but that's what i'm trying to uh challenge people and show people is i've had great success because uh, transitioning out of the military was hard but it's been easier plugging into communities like the off-road community and uh for me the gym gym community and the uh, hunting community so I find that all all three of those have been in very similar wavelengths to the sort of wavelength that I'm on and they don't have to necessarily be a veteran but at least we're you know like-minded and can can kind of uh, interact with each other like we're meant to as humans and be able to breathe positivity and life into each other and so that actually leads me to another question I had for you was, um, which I've forgotten, my brain injury is just kicking in. I <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, what was I going to ask? Damn. How did uh, I become so hard Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, right. I'm glad we reviewed, I'm <laughs> glad we went over some of these beforehand, but because it'll, it'll come in my mind for a split second and then it's gone. Uh, she, for, if you can't hear, her, she just reminded me of what it, what it was. Uh, how how did you become such a hard worker, and like what what do you believe uh, like in, has happened in your life that's made you that way? You know, whether it's your parents and stuff like that, or your upbringing. Uh, if you want to talk about that, go ahead. Um, so I started out in Alaska. Um, I spent my whole life there, and. Um, Things are really challenging there. We have a challenging um, economy, very expensive, um, cost of living is very high. Um, then we have our weather, which makes very you know everything very challenging. Um, we are limited on stores. Growing up, there wasn't the internet and everything being able to purchase so easily. Um, so uh, we didn't have a lot of money growing up. My mom is extremely hard worker. Um, and so I got a lot of my hard working just from my seeing my mom. So I just assumed everybody was a hard worker, you know, because my mom, I mean, she's just, I mean, she'd get exhausted and still hard charging. And so that's what I saw. And I thought that that's what I was supposed to be like. Um, 
so that's how I was raised you know you just work and you work and you work and you work and you work hard and you make ethical decisions and even when no one's looking you know you do the right thing um so that was my upbringing um I started working at a very young age um to try to help with you know paying for everything and um I ended up leaving home at a very young age um so I was trying to be in high school and I was trying to um go to college um full time and then I was also working two jobs and racing and wheeling and building so my life was crazy um and then I just kind of started my life like that and I thought that was normal um just just hard charging all the time I, I wasn't doing a lot of um fun things that kids would be doing and I say wasting their time on <laughs> um I was working all the time and um, always focused on either if I was I was either working making money or I was training so that way I could make money so making money was a big thing just because we didn't have it growing up um so I was always focused on that um, I was not really focused on growing relationships with people. I didn't have time for it. Um, I had time to just work on what I needed to work on to be successful. Um, I hung out with a lot of the old guys in the shop, building stuff, working on things um, in my spare time. And uh, so I learned a lot from them. And they would always say, you know, you need to buy a house. That's what you need to do. Don't waste your money on rent. Um, so I quickly um, started looking for houses when I turned 18 when I could legally buy a house um, found one I liked and, and bought it um, and then I, I had that one for a couple years and then upgraded to a bigger one because the first one you know is your starter home um, and I'm working hard through all this um, minimum at least you know one job most of the time I always had two um, very focused um, but I wasn't I wasn't there for my extended family um, I wasn't really there for the, you know, close relationships I was having. Um, I just didn't have time. I kept having to say, I can't do that, I can't do that, I can't do that, I can't do that. Um, sorry. But I was being successful and I was able to make it very, very well um, in anything I was doing because I focused all my time and energy on that. Um, whether it was, um, I was in a, you know, GM Tech, uh, I was a GM Tech in a dealership. Um, I worked at a Freightliner dealership, um, worked in the military. Um, I was doing well in each one of those, um, doing well in college, you know, straight A student. Um, so I was doing well in all those aspects, but I felt like I wasn't, um, you know, getting close relationships. I wasn't putting that time and effort into um, building those because I was so busy. Um, so when I got pregnant and I became a stay-at-home mom, um, I kind of switched gears a little bit. Um, and I had time available um, for my family and um, time for my extended family, time for my daughter. I was able to teach her things. Um, and I loved helping people, which is something I didn't really get to do very much of because I didn't have a lot of extra time. Um, so I, you know, when my grandma was ill, I was able to just stay in the hospital with her. Um, when my father was ill, I was able to stay in the hospital with him. Um, and I was able to just help people and I felt this love, you know, God's love shining through me um, in these experiences, which I wasn't able to do before. So I, I, I just I, uh, had just kind of a switch. Now I don't, uh, I don't have very much money. I'm divorced now. And I, um, so on the flip side, I used to focus everything about trying to make a bunch of money. And now I'm trying to survive. Um, but I am rich in um, the experiences that I get with people. Um, and I want to, when I meet somebody, I really want to meet them. I want to spend a moment with them and find out who they are, what they're doing in life. I want to grow and learn through them. And if I have anything that I can give, I want to give that experience to them too and give them my testimony or um, help them in some way. Um, so that's kind of where I'm at in life now, where I, I just get contacted by people who are, have a need. Um, and I got kind of a weird skill set of being a mechanic, um, a welder, uh, a driver, co-driver. Um, you know, I know how to do logistics, um, haul truck and trailer, you know what I mean? Everything that has to do with racing, 
I'm, I'm got that skill set and then same in the hunting world now um, I've got a pretty good skill set that works well there with you know, navigating and um, survival skills and um, you know being able to stalk and process you know feel dress um, figure out what to do when you break down navigate river crossings and um, everything that comes along with um, hunting I'm pretty well-rounded with those two uh, you know things that are in my life I, I have a skill set that works well for both of those so um, instead of just keeping that within me and making myself successful I would love sharing it with people and I love helping people um, so I'm feeling very rich in that sense um, and I get to work hard I'm still working hard I've been working hard my entire life um, I'm just not working hard to make myself a lot of money or make myself um, you know grow and benefit in a career necessarily I want to help other people fulfill their dreams with my skill set um, if that makes sense but uh, yeah I love, <laughs> I love working hard <laughs> I'm that person that wants to you know well, let's just get this knocked out and let's just you know work on this tonight and you know and we can get this done and um, you know let's just keep going or when things are gloom and doom and everyone's you know thinking that it's going to be too rough or too hard or whatever I try to be positive and and keep charging hard and one foot front and the other you know sometimes I really don't know how things are going to work out um, but I just keep putting one foot in front of the other and keep trying and keep working and keep my mind open to strategies and troubleshooting and <laughs> are you ready for your next question yeah um, I, I always always appreciate uh, hard workers because um, I, I feel that I am one but and it it came from my father it was his his saying is quote unquote uh work 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 that's what i always say like that's <laughs> and that's just it is just keep working you know and i was um my brother who is an officer in the military i was enlisted he was very good at managing the work that i was doing um so <laughs> I didn't realize that until I was older, but I do. I just I get a lot of enjoyment out of it, um, seeing things to completion. You know, seeing a a mess turn into order. You know, or something broken fixed. And but uh, enough of me about me. I know we have a limited time. I want to ask you about your travels as far as off roading. We know you travel all over the place and. I'm going to include a, a link to that article that was written on you in, in the uh, description of this podcast and so people will be able to go and see your extensive bio because it's too hard for me to, and we might be the rest of the trip if you're <laughs> to list off everything, um, but it, 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 is, it is pretty impressive to see um, everything that you've done and I encourage people to check that out. But uh in this article they mentioned that you had gone over to france for an ultra four event over there so i wanted to know um you said that you've your hunting has been pretty much restricted to alaska so you can touch on that afterwards but i would like to know where where all has uh, off-roading taken you around the world I wanted to add a little bit to what you were saying about the, um, you know, your father and working hard and such. And um, one extra benefit of that I've found from working really hard is physically you don't have to go to the gym. <laughs> so it's been, if you're like, how do you stay in shape? I'm like, because I don't stop moving. I keep saying yes. I keep saying, how can I help you? Hey, do you need a hand? Um, and I just keep working hard and working hard. And so I physically don't have to worry about going to the gym. Um, and also, you're, you know, when you keep working hard, you're learning. When you keep facing challenges instead of turning away from them, you learn. Every challenge that I've had, um, I get smarter and smarter and smarter and smarter. And so when I have challenges in the future, I already have a tool set of experiences that I can pick from and help me on my next challenge. And um, so I love it. I love being able to just, you know, keep working hard like you're saying um, and always face a challenge. I don't think I've ever turned away from a challenge, you know. Um, 
So, uh, and I sleep good at night usually because <laughs> you're exhausted. <laughs> um, I always tell people, I can't sleep very well. I was like, oh, well, go try doing something physical or, you know, challenge yourself or something and um, get all your energy out before you try to go to sleep. But, uh, um, so uh, there's that. And then uh, you were asking me about France. Um, so I was helping at King of the Hammers um, a few years ago and um, I was working for Dave Cole and he um, asked me to crew chief for his son Bailey Cole and so uh, he had two vehicles he was running in the King of the Hammers race um, and those of you that don't know King of the Hammers is a very brutal race it's uh, I think the toughest off road in the US I mean it's a um, combination of rock crawling very very fast rock crawling and uh, desert racing so you're going fast and you're going fast over rocks it's insane um, if you don't know what it is, look it up and check it out. It's uh, it's probably one of my favorite races ever. So I was helping him um, and his son Bailey Cole and their race team. Um, Bailey had a co-driver that came over from Belgium. Um, his name was Sten. Um, Walter is Sten's brother, who also came with him, and they were very, very, very helpful. Um, helping get the car prepped and we had a lot of issues with transmission and they were very helpful every step of the way um, also extremely hard working um, right there with me because I'd work 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 all day all night and very few people actually stayed with me the entire time working um, but Sten and Walter were right there they were super awesome um, so when it came time for them to race in Europe I told them, hey, you came over and you were awesome and helpful to me. I want to return the favor. I would love to come over and help you race your race because um, Ultra 4 has a, a Ultra 4 Europe series um, that they race there. So um, I went over and they said, come on over early because we need to do some stuff on the car. I came over early and we did a lot of stuff on the car. Um, I was able to step up my fabrication skills quite a bit and that was fun. Um, got to learn how to TIG weld aluminum because we had to put a whole new floor in, a whole new dash, um, electrical, engine management, um, skid plate. I mean, we did some major, major, major work to this vehicle. Um, came down to we needed um, some parts and we were not able to get those parts in time for the race. Um, so that particular vehicle that we had worked so hard on night and day, every single day, um, did not make it to the, to the track. We still went um, to provide support for a lot of the teams that were um, racing at the King of France race. Um, I think that race is probably one of my f most favorite Ultra 4 races ever. Um, being able to have such a wide bite diversity. I mean, there was four or five different languages being talked. Um, so it was confusing. I only know English. So <laughs> that was, it was, it was a challenge. Um, I came back from that race over here and only having to deal with just English. I'm like, oh man, it's so much easier. <laughs> um, so I came, I had much more appreciation for, uh, the races here in the U S. Um, but everyone welcomed me with wide open arms. Um, I ended up working in the hot pit. Pretty much any car that came in, um, tried to figure out what's wrong with it. Sometimes it was in a different language, so there was a lot of pointing. Um, but uh, we worked on um, over a dozen cars. I mean, constantly, all day for two days, um, working on different cars and making them successful. And I didn't care who they were. I was going to work hard on their car, get them back out on the track. Um, so did that, had a blast. The people were amazing. Um, I made I made some lifelong friendships from that trip. Um, just It's just funny being in a different place. I, I didn't get to see very much, uh, you know, outside of the shop we were in and outside of the racetrack. Um, but, uh, but I got to see and, and experience something that um, I hope I get to do again. It was amazing I, I try to tell everybody if they get the chance to go race ultra four over in europe they they should do that um and then uh, in regards to your do you have any more questions before i move on to the next one okay um so in regards to hunting um i um 
I like to do some pretty extreme stuff. Um, my daughter is always with me for the most part. Um, and she is eight now. Um, so she's been, her whole life has been hunting. Uh, she, this last year, um, got her first caribou. Uh, it was an amazing experience. And uh, it was... I couldn't speak. I mean, I was truly speechless after um, seeing her take her first big game. Uh, she had gotten some other um, animals. She had been hunting for a few years, but um, this last year getting caribou was her first big game. Um, there was a gentleman um, who's older, um, who's got cancer, and I usually get a caribou for every year. Um, and he wanted to have my daughter get her, get him a caribou. Um, so there was a handed down gun, um, a 243, just single shot break action. Um, kind of a challenging gun to, for a, uh, seven year old, <laughs> but, um, he wanted her to get a caribou for him with that gun. And so she trained on it, um, for a year, um, ran out and uh, we I expected her to, to shoot within a hundred yards that's kind of the range I was given her um, and I had already gotten I think six caribou and like three moose um, up until this point and we were getting to the end of our hunting season um, and we were planning on leaving the next day um, so we decided that we we're going to spend the day trying to get her a caribou and she was so patient. The weather in Alaska is pretty crazy during hunting season and she waited through all that weather. Yeah, we have some directions coming up. Let's see. Sorry, I have to do navigation real quick. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so my daughter sat there for six hours um, trying to wait for some caribou. We saw him about a mile out, um, and so she's waiting for him to get closer. Stalking's pretty hard in this area because there's, there's no train features, really. Um, it's all open. So I, I saw him, and I was pretty sure they were going to come our way. Um, sure enough, six hours later, we had three caribou come in our direction. Um, and she took a shot at 291 yards um, and caribou dropped. It was crazy. I was just in shock. Um, she had seen animals, you know, taken um, for years. So for her, she didn't understand why it was such a big deal. And I usually take my, my shots pretty far out because of the lack of the terrain um, for cover. So, uh, yeah, that was an amazing experience. Went down and um, we were able to, you know, field dress it. Um, and with all the meat that we get, we feed community. I mean, we feed families um, within communities uh, this amazingly healthy meat. Um, and that's, that's my way of giving back. I love it. Um, I feel like um, I'm helping make a difference. Some people, you know, work at the soup kitchen. Some people um, donate uh, food to food drives and such. Um, the way I feel like I can give back is use my skill set to feed families um, very healthy meat that's not been affected, you know, by hormones and such, um, like, uh, you know, cow um, that you'd get from the grocery store. Um, so yeah, that, that's kind of the way we live our life for hunting season. Usually July, August, September, we focus on um, trying to harvest animals um, for the winter in Alaska. Um, that's kind of been our traditional way of life up there. Um, and it's still that way today. And uh, my daughter is Alaska native. Um, so I want to have her see traditionally, you know, what 
her family has been doing um, and is still doing and I want to keep those traditionals alive um, there may be a, t a time when we need that skill set um, especially living in Alaska it, there's it's pretty harsh um, and and things are a little crazy sometimes I mean I've gotten flash flooding happening I get stuck on you know an, an area where there is no food and I have to rely on my skill set of hunting to be able to survive and to keep other people alive um, so I don't trophy hunt um, I'm, I'm just meat hunter go out there um, subsistence lifestyle um, that's what I'm teaching my daughter um, that's what I'm promoting um, I love teaching people how to hunt uh, because uh, it's kind of a skill that's being lost um, it's not being handed down traditionally um, as much as it was before um, so I I love taking people out that don't know anything um, that know a little bit that know a lot it doesn't matter their skill set I just I enjoy being in the woods with people um, whether I'm learning or they're learning um, yeah it's a huge part of my life now <laughs> Uh, I think that's awesome. Um, real quick, because we're entering in, in, uh, ending our trip here, and I hope this uh, podcast turns out well, but I'll give you a choice of uh, questions like speak as much as you want about either, but what what are you doing next, and what, you know, what are you going to be working on in the future? And also, uh, do... Do you find hunting, off-roading uh, to be therapeutic for, um, you know, the things you're dealing with in life, whether it's mental or physical, and, and or do you do anything else for therapy, such as, like, meditation? I know you're a Christian, but, uh, so maybe going to church or whatever, but. Um, I do feel like that it is um, a therapeutic kind of thing to me. Um, but the physical act of it, I enjoy, and I can, I have a skill set that can do well with it. Um, I think the people is the biggest thing. Um, I enjoy being around people and I enjoy having a goal and a goal that, um, I feel comfortable with trying to achieve. Um, I love learning. <laughs> That's the biggest thing. Like I have, I have just as much fun going and training um, for a particular type of motorsports than I do actually racing it. Um, I love just getting a little bit smarter, a little bit faster, a little bit better. I love the connections that I make with somebody when I'm training with them. Um, I love hearing you know, their background, where they came from, and how they got their skill set too. So um, it's therapeutic in the sense of uh, interpersonal relationships. I get to be able to go somewhere and we we all have similar backgrounds and we all want to do the same thing or similar things and I can I can just instantly go into a room and be able to start talking to them um, I love that and uh, Motorsports has given me that platform to be able to connect with people um, that way So there's some race teams that I've um, raced with that do have God a part of what they're doing um, and how they run their race team. And I've found that is just amazing on a spiritual level um, to be able to have God a part of, you know, what you're trying to accomplish. Because we're trying to accomplish some pretty crazy things, especially, you know, the longer races, um, races in Mexico. There's a potential um, for disaster. There's a potential for people to get hurt. Um, stress is really high um, so being able to grow in my faith um, with these teams has been an awesome side effect of this too and be able to just show people my uh, my life and my testimony my daughter loves talking to people everywhere we go about God um, so getting to meet people and connect that way also has been amazing and therapeutic um, and being able to show the show the world God's love, um, what better way than on a mass scale? Because <laughs> I I will meet sixty to hundred people on average a week. I meet people constantly, um, and the more people we can meet, the more people we can show God's love to. So. 
w- what about what what you have coming up next? Um, so off the top of my head, what I can remember, I got a lot of things going on. Um, but I'm gonna leave um, Oklahoma City. I'm gonna head over to South Carolina and do some um, wheeling and training in that area. Um, it's a little bit different. Everywhere I go, the train's different. I love it. I just want to keep learning all the different trains of the world. Um, every rock is, you know, every place has got different rocks and they got different kinds of mud. Um, so I want to go over there, experience South Carolina area um, with uh, Fred Perry and Chris Durham. Go there, do that, have some fun um, for three days, and then go back to Salt Lake City. Um, I'm going to meet up with Clay Egan. Um, and compete in his rock buggy um, at the old school competition in Delta, Utah. Um, From there, um, I'll go down San Diego and meet up with Chris Barnett, and we're going to go down and race a UTV in the Baja 500. Um, From there, I'm going to go over to Texas for the Dirt Riot race, um, after that, I'm probably going to go home, I'm hoping. <laughs> I haven't been home in many months. Um, and uh, I, I need to get my vehicle ready, my off-road rig ready for hunting season. Um, then I'll be back down, and we've got the ladies' um, fab school. We've got ladies' off-road conference, Jeepers Jamboree, all for fun in Colorado. Um, I have... Uh, to go to uh, Cascadero, um, where Courtney and I um, are going to be building a 69 Wagoneer to compete in the Rebel Rally. We need to do that build. Um, I have uh, a couple more races coming up. We got Ultra 4. I want to do more Dirt Riot. Um, yeah, so my life is going to be uh, pretty much racing. Um, up until um, August, early August, I think August 3rd um, is when I'll head back to Alaska and hunting season will be all of August and September. Um, then I'll come back down, do some more racing probably, do that Rebel Rally which is in October um, and that, that is an amazing race. If you're not sure what it is, check it out. It's an uh, all women's race, 1200 miles, no electronics. So it's map and compass. Um, it's going to be amazing. A full week of racing. Emily Miller puts it on. Um, she does such a great job. Um, I'm, I'm really excited. I look forward to that. Um, the team we are is Team Trail Tested. Um, Courtney and I, that's our team. And um, she owns, with her boyfriend, a manufacturing company called Trail Tested. And we get to use their shop. It's amazing. Um, so, yeah, there's kind of some stuff coming up. Um, got the Baja thousand of course is the uh, 50th anniversary everybody's excited about that so i'll be down there doing um there and uh yeah anything else that comes my way sometimes things uh, i know ahead of time and a lot of times i have no idea i'm about to get into something until it starts happening <laughs> where can people find you online um, I have my personal Facebook page, Martha Tansy, and then I have a business page, which is Martha Tansy Off-Road um, Racing and Hunting. Um, I've been kind of keeping those both updated about the same. Um, and then Instagram has been really good, too. Um, just Martha Tansy on Instagram. Awesome. Well, we're here at the airport, so we'll uh, finish up this podcast, but... It was a pleasure meeting you, and I'm so glad we got to spend some time together and uh, get to know you a little more. Uh, So hope to see you in the off-road racing scene in the future and maybe get up to Alaska and do some hunting together. All right. Yeah, it was great meeting you, and thank you so much for taking me to the airport and doing this podcast. That's amazing. Um, And, yeah, I do hope to see you. And I'm excited for your off-road racing and your stock class Jeep. He showed me the pictures, and it's going to be so much fun. Like, it's going to be really fun. I love stock class. So I'm excited for you also. And, uh, yeah, come up on to Alaska, and I'll show you some crazy stuff. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you.